Thank you very much, Tommy. Welcome, everyone. Let's see if this works. Cool, it does. Um, so before we get into it, just want to quickly say who I am, kind of why you should be listening to me. Um, so as Tom said, I'm a platform engineer here at Giant Swarm. So I've been with Giant Swarm about a year and a half now. Um, and in that time, I've worked in a couple of teams working on some of the cloud uh, stuff. So around AWS, GCP, Azure, um, and more recently working on CICD stuff. Um, so release engineering, things like that. Um, if you want to find me around the web, I'm usually average Marcus in most places. Or if you're on Mastodon, you can find me uh, on kh.social as at Marcus. Um, I'm happy to take any questions and stuff on any of those platforms that you find me. Um, so a bit of my background, I've had experience, I've had about five years experience with Kubernetes um, in production environments. So I started off as an app developer working in JavaScript kind of back in the day. Um, and Kubernetes uh, was what we were using to deploy our applications to, to manage all of our microservices and things like that. Um, I later moved into a more of a tooling team where I was building out solutions to work on top of Kubernetes for other teams within the company. Um, and then later moved to Giant Swarm where I did more of an actual platform building and operation of clusters. So I've, I've kind of had a, uh, a bit of experience with like the whole gamut of interactions with, with Kubernetes. Um, so with that in mind, I'm going to tell you about my relationship with webhooks in Kubernetes. And this is a story in three acts. So in the, in the beginning, I'm going to give you the introduction, the kind of the backstory and all the wonders and kind of setting up all the good things about webhooks that you can, can do within Kubernetes. When we move into act two, I'm going to start showing you some of the conflicts and struggles and the woes. This is where things go catastrophically wrong. And then hopefully in Act 3, we are going to talk about the resolution, how we can fix these things, and what is the potential for the future around this area in Kubernetes. So without further ado, let's move on to Act 1. So for those that aren't aware, um, there are effectively three types of webhooks within Kubernetes. There's a validating webhook configuration, a mutating webhook configuration, and a custom resource conversion um as you see these were introduced quite early on so 1.9 113 things like that um so they've been around for a while and they're quite a staple of the kubernetes project now um for the purposes of this talk we're going to focus on the first two of these so these first two are grouped under um admission uh, dynamic admission controllers whereas the third one the custom resource conversion is specifically about uh, crds and uh, converting between different versions of crds so we're going to ignore that for the, for the purpose of this talk so as I said, they are part of this dynamic admission control. Um, both the validating and mutating webhooks live under this controller, um, and they can be triggered on uh, by, by almost all API operations on almost all Kubernetes resources within your cluster. So any time you do a get, a create, a delete, whatever, it is possible to have a webhook triggered based on that action. There is a very slight caveat that we will come to later in this talk, but for the purposes of it, you can kind of use them against anything to add some either validating logic or some mutating logic, depending on which one you're using. Uh, both of these are part of the admission registration API, um, and they're enabled by default in all recent versions of Kubernetes. But if you do decide that you want to disable them for whatever reason, there is an API server flag that enable admission plugins that you can use to, to override this behavior. If you're interested in kind of how webhooks work, kind of the, the meat of them, the documentation on the Kubernetes website is fantastic. I highly recommend going and having a look at it. There's a lot of information in there um, that I can't provide within the time we've got now. So if you're interested, go, go and check it out. So I want to go through the kind of purposes and use cases that you have with these webhooks. And I generally see them fitting into these four major categories. So we've got defaulting logic, policy enforcement, best practices, and problem mitigation. Um, policy enforcement and best practices, we will often see a lot of overlap, um, but there are kind of scenarios where I, I think they're enough to, to treat them as separately. So we'll, we'll dig into that a little bit. So the first one I want to talk about is defaulting. Um, so this is where mutating webhooks can give us some power to um, uh, basically not have to provide all values up front. So our, our application developers that are defining their deployment YAML, for example, don't need to know every single value that they need to pop 
it would be possible to leave some of those values out and have a mutating webhook default those values. So a good example of this is image pull secrets. So if in our organization we are using a private Docker registry that requires secrets to, to authenticate with, we could have a mutating webhook that automatically injects that image pull secrets uh, property into every pod upon creation so that we don't need to share that knowledge with our uh, application developers when they don't really need to know about it for the, for the purposes of building their application. Um, similarly, there are things like injecting sidecars. So Istio in the past was quite uh, basically popularized this, this technique where upon creation of a pod, uh, it will automatically inject another container uh, referred to as a sidecar alongside the existing containers within that pod. And this then allowed Istio to kind of uh, interact more with the pod, dig out some details from the pod and uh, enable like, the, the, the server mesh capabilities. Um, there are other applications that also do similar. So we've seen this similar with uh, metrics and logging that, that do a similar sort of thing. Um, but there's also kind of other scenarios where you may want to do it yourself um, for various reasons. Uh, the final one that I want to, want to call out is also um, proxy environment variables. So if you have a cluster that is running in a uh, like an air gapped environment or a, uh, an environment that has to, the, the networking has to go through a proxy um, to be able to connect to the outside world, for example, um, you don't necessarily want to have to tell every team's what that value is and tell every teams when that value updates and all these kind of things so it's possible then that you could automatically inject these http proxy and no proxy environment variables inside every pod that is created so that then the cluster operator has control over what those values are and how they change and, and things like that and you don't need to kind of go through this um, back and forth with developer teams to make sure that they're including it in their uh, manifest and there's, there's plenty of other scenarios where you could um, potentially want defaulting logic. Policy enforcement. So this is very popular in enterprise environments, but um, it, it kind of can suit any, any scenario really, any um, cluster. Um, so you may have rules within your organization to disallow the use of the latest image tag um, in, your, in your containers, uh, for security reasons like you, you want to ensure that what you're pulling in is something that you've tested that you know is safe uh, at least to the best of your ability and you don't want that latest uh, image to potentially break your application down the line when that latest image changes so you could have a validating webhook that will prevent any references to the latest tag in your pods and it will basically just block the creation of those pods if they exist it will, it will throw up an error um, similarly, you may want to do things around preventing the use of deprecated Kubernetes APIs. Um, so if you are aware that you will soon be upgrading to a new version of Kubernetes that has a removed uh, API version. So the example I've got here is the batch slash v1 beta one for the uh, cron jobs, for example. You may want to uh, proactively block the use of those APIs early on before the migration before the upgrade is performed so that your teams get that early um, notification of the changes that they need to make to their to their manifest um, similarly there's things like uh, replacing some of the old psp functionality that has now been removed from the latest version of kubernetes um, the pod security admission that replaces it doesn't have the full feature set that, that the old PSPs did have. So if you do re rely on some of those functionalities, you will need to use uh, mutating and validated webhooks potentially to re-instigate that functionality within your cluster. So best practices, this, like I said, kind of overlaps a bit with the policy enforcement. So um, for example, not using the latest uh, tag could also be considered a best practice approach. Um, some of the examples that I like to pull out here is the use of a standard set of labels and annotations on all your resources. So especially if you're working in a multi-tenant cluster where there are different teams deploying their own application into the same cluster, you may want to have either a validating webhook or a mutating webhook that ensures that a standard set of labels are applied to say kind of who the owning team is what the application is for and kind of like I don't know, the, the priority of that application for on-call and disaster recovery and all this kind of thing. 
Um, so you can have the, your webhooks that either enforce those or potentially default those if possible. Um, similarly, you may want to uh, enforce the use of uh, probes within your your pods, so your your health checks. So if you if you are serious about uh, your application's health and making sure that everything stays up and running, you really need all of your pods to have health checks on them, have these probes on them. So you may have a validating webhook that enforces that uh, at creation time so that when deploying a new application to it, it has to have those probes available to use. Um, and similarly, you may want to use an in-house uh, uh, Docker registry for your images. So like I said earlier, it may be that you're using an authenticated one, so you need to have that image pull secrets. But similarly, you may have a, 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 a local cache registry that you use as a pull through proxy. So you could automatically update all references to Docker Hub, for example, um, to point to your in-house uh, registry without having to do any changes to those manifests. So that can be happening on the fly as the pods are created. And finally, problem mitigation. So this is one that I, I quite I find quite interesting. So I've seen scenarios where um, webhooks can be used uh, for security reasons. So one of the examples that I like to share, and I've got, uh, I will come to it a bit later in this talk, is the ability to block the log4 shell um, uh, security vulnerability. So I'm sure I'm sure many of you remember from uh, God, a few years ago now, I don't know when it was, um, the log4j, um, log4 shell uh, uh, CVE was uh, kind of rampant on the internet and there was many many java applications were susceptible to this injection um now the way to block that functionality to kind of turn off that in that that vulnerability was to set this environment variable log4j format message no lookups uh, in the environment that the application was running to a, a particular value and that kind of turned off the code path that was susceptible to the injection now it's possible to then do this with a, a mutating webhook so that all pods automatically got this environment variable injected into them. So effectively turned off log4j vulnerability um, cluster wide, which is very nice. And I'll, I said, I'll come to this a little bit uh, further on. Uh, but you can also do things like uh, uh, blocking the use of privilege escalation within your cluster um, and blocking nodes uh, joining your cluster with a known CVEs based on the kernel version. So um, the nodes that the, the node resource that gets created in your cluster has a bunch of labels and annotations on it. And one of those actually gives you the kernel version of the node of the OS and uh, stuff that's running that's running that node. It is possible to use webhooks to block that node from actually joining the cluster. So you can ensure that um, vulnerable nodes never actually make it into your cluster in the first place. So we've heard how great they are. Let's have a little look at how you kind of how you create a webhook. So the example I've got here is a validating webhook. Um, so this allows you to effectively uh, allow or disallow a, an action from happening. Um, here we are specifying a set of rules. So this is the actions that it's, that it's going to be uh, going to apply against. So in this scenario, it's for every pod that is created, um, regardless of the, of the namespace, um, this webhook will apply to it. Um, we are going to apply a namespace selector and an object selector. So the namespace selector says, this webhook I only want to run if the namespace uh, is not in kube system. So if it's a kube system pod, let it be it can it can go and be created otherwise hold off i'm going to run my webhook against it first and then the object selector says actually i only want to run against those pods that then have this label that is owned by my team so we can we can be really specific as to what resources we are targeting with this webhook uh, we want to set a failure policy so that uh, if the webhook fails with an error rather than actually returning, so if it crashes for whatever reason, um, the webhook will will block the creation. It won't allow it to go through. We could set that to ignore so that if the webhook um, code crashes for whatever reason, the webhook uh, controller will say, okay, let's let it through anyway without the, the getting the response from the webhook. 
Um, be careful as to what you set this to. So if your webhook is for security reasons, you kind of want this set to fail. Um, if it's something that's more around like best practice and things like that, you may want to set this to ignore so that you don't potentially block uh, pod creations and things like that. And finally, there's this client config section. So this is where it tells our, uh, well, this is where it tells Kubernetes, sorry, where our webhook application lives. So here we give it a service to point to. So that service will then have to be backed by a, a deployment, a pod, whatever, um, that will then listen out for that webhook um, and respond accordingly with a, with a correct you know, payload response. Um, in this scenario, the uh, service is called example webhook in the default namespace and it's listening on the port 443 on the validate uh, pods endpoint. So every time a pod is created that matches those um, selects and stuff that we've seen above, that application will get a rest call adds that path uh, from the API server. So a little example of, of how all of this kind of works within the, the cluster. So up at the top, we've got the uh, mutating webhook configuration. So this is our uh, YAML manifest. We are applying that to our cluster. Once that's done, that resource then lives within Kubernetes. And the API server will then keep checking that against API calls that it gets to see if it needs to trigger it. So for example, we will have a pod. Um, it will be created, updated, deleted, whatever the operation is against it. That API call is sent to the API server within Kubernetes. And what it does, it first goes and checks all of the matching mutating uh, webhooks um, to see if any of those match the API call that we've got. So any that uh, are for a pod with one of those operations, for example. Um, and it will go through all of those and it will apply those mutations to the pod. Now, one thing to note here is um, the ordering of those webhooks is not guaranteed. In practice, they are generally done alphabetically, but there is no guarantee on that. So do not rely on that behavior. Um, once all of those webhooks have uh, uh, been processed and the uh, API call has been mutated, it will then go through the built-in schema validation. So this is where Kubernetes, this is this is what Kubernetes does for every API call to make sure that the, uh, the payload that it's working with matches the types that it expects. So in a pod, for example, it makes sure that the values uh, match the right types for every property in the pod, things like that. After that's come back as successful, it will then go through all of the validating webhooks. So it'll, it'll do the same thing, it'll, it'll iterate through them all. And if any of those come back and say, nope, block this, it will then stop and it will reject that API call and return an error to the user. If all those come back and say it's successful, the API call then completes and it persists into etcd. It, it does whatever that API call was meant to do. Um, so as I said, there's no order, there's no guarantee of the order of the webhooks individually done, but the order is always mutating webhooks first, then validating webhooks. Um, and it is possible that a webhook can get re-triggered based on a mutation. Um, there is there's properties to do that, so just be a little bit aware of. So some of these wonders in the wild. Um, so the middle one here is, is what I mentioned earlier. So this is log4 shell. Um, so this is an example of using Caverno, uh, which is a, a, a tool we'll come to in a second, to turn off that log4 shell uh, vulnerability uh, by effectively setting that um, environment variable in all parts, like I said. It's, it was a fantastic use of a mutating web hook. Similarly, on the left, um, this is a scenario we had at Giant Swarm. So we uh, had a problem where our CLI tooling that our customers use um, had a bug in it where it was accidentally deleting all certificates rather than a specific certificate uh, in a particular API call. This, this led to everybody in that cluster being logged out at the same time uh, rather than the individual user being logged out. Um, and it was kind of causing a lot of problems um, for, for other people. Now we were able to solve this by fixing the bug in our CLI tool, but it meant that everybody required that everybody was required to then update the, their tool to, to get this latest version that, you know, that would take time. I'm sure you're all aware how long it takes for customers to upgrade things. So we needed a kind of hot fix uh, in the meantime. And what we were able to do is use a webhook that blocked the very specific API call which was um, 
a, a batch, a bulk delete of this certificate against against a particular you know, set of requirements. Um, and we could apply that to all of our clusters that then meant that an error was actually returned back to the CLI. And we were able to provide details in that to say, look, there's a there's a problem with the CLI tool you need to update. And that will that got displayed out to the users in the CLI. It was a very nice way for us to hot fix a problem in the wild while we waited for the actual long term fix to get applied. Um, and then finally, on the right, um, as I mentioned already, is uh, Istio kind of uh, popularized this this use of mutating webhooks to inject a sidecar within uh, all pods within a cluster. So back in the early days, this is this has changed these days. They use uh, a bunch of other techniques, uh, but in the early days, they were heavily reliant on uh, mutating webhooks to kind of introduce this this core functionality into their product. So I want to quickly have a look at some of the alternatives to, to webhooks that are available in Kubernetes. So um, I'm going to talk about two things, initializers and pod presets. So initializers were introduced in version 1.7, so way back when. And this was a way of configuring uh, out of tree code that can modify resource before it's actually created. What this means is effectively the same as what a mutating webhook does. It allows you to make changes to a resource before it's, it's permitted into etcd. Um, each initializer relied on um, the operator, the, the, the code that was running to have a watch um, for these resources to look out for ones that had an initializer set on them and make the changes and then remove the initializer. So these were actually kind of the opposite of a finalizer within, within Kubernetes. So they worked in the same way. It was just a, a list of values as an initializer and each one of those kind of halted operations until it was removed. Um, so the API server uh, sets them as pending until that initial uh, initializer's object is, is empty. Um, similarly, pod presets. So these were namespace scopes. So these were, were quite handy for teams to define default uh, values that they wanted. So for example, you could use these to inject default resource requests and limits for all pods created within namespace. Um, it's quite handy, very, very nice. The problem with these two, though, is they've both now been removed. Um, so initialize removed in version 116, the pod presets removed in 120. So they're no longer available. So all we've got is webhooks. And now the reason these were released is because we've got webhooks that can do all of this functionality already and a lot more. So it, it didn't make sense to have multiple code that did the same thing. So. We've seen some of the wonders, we've kind of seen what webhooks are and how they work. Let's look at how things can go wrong. So I'm gonna talk about the woes here. Um, these are all scenarios that have happened that either I've seen myself or I've seen others report or, or discussed about on, on the web, things like that. Um, these, these are all scenarios where the cluster has broke in some way thanks to a misconfigured webhook. Um, during this process, I am going to call out some specific tools, but it's for context only, and I'm not trying to put blame or fault on those tools. They are fantastic tools. They just can be misconfigured and things break, just like everything else. Um, the fault of all these is kind of the fragile, fragility of webhooks in Kubernetes and the amount of work you need to go to to make sure that your cluster is resilient to them uh, kind of going wrong. And that's what I'm hoping to, to go through now. So number one, um, this is a scenario where we're using a tool called Caverno. So Caverno is a fantastic tool that allows you to abstract away uh, creating these webhooks into uh, Kubernetes um, uh, uh, resources. So that Caverno provides you with kind of these policy and cluster policy resources that allow you to much more easily create uh, webhooks based on kind of YAML defined logic rather than having to write your own code each time. It allows you like a lot of defaulting, validating logic really easily, really quickly using a single tool. Uh, a lot of the policies um, that we use Caverno for are, are security related. So replacing a lot of the old PSP functionality. So to to block the, the use of, of various things or, or whatever. And as such, the failure policy on these are a set to false. They're set to, sorry, set to fail. So that if for whatever reason the the the, the Caverno is not running, the webhook will fail and prevent the creation. 
Um, now, for resilience, the service behind uh, the Webhooks of Caverno, it runs at least two replicas in, our, in, in this scenario. And uh, Caverno actually has some logic built into it that will deregister the webhook when the last replica is, is removed from the cluster. So it has a, a catch point and shut it down. If it is the last uh, instance of Caverno running, it will remove the webhooks from the cluster. Uh, pod antifinity is in place to ensure these replicas are scheduled onto different nodes. So with all that said, what went wrong? Um, by sheer chance, both of the pods that were scheduled onto nodes uh, were within the same failure domain. So uh, in AZ, uh, in AWS, for example, this is the same uh, AZ within, within the region or, or whatever. But they, were all, they were basically scheduled on nodes that were next to each other. Something happened. We don't know exactly what, but something happened that caused that failure domain to fail. So this was likely uh, an issue in the cloud uh, provider. For whatever reason, that network, uh, sorry, that failure domain became unavailable. Um, it, it could be that either we made a mistake and accidentally deleted uh, that AZ, or you know there may have been a power fault in the cloud provider, or a networking routing error, whatever it may be, doesn't matter for this uh, purpose. But because that happened, both of the Caverno pods are suddenly and instantly missing from our cluster. They didn't trigger their shutdown logic, so the uh, webhook didn't get deregistered. Um, and the scheduler tr does its job, and it tries to schedule two new pods, because that's what the deployment spec uh, specifies. The API server then receives this API call to create these two new pods, and it checks its list of mutating webhooks, and it sees an entry for a Caverno webhook. So it makes a request to the Caverno service to see, am I allowed to create these new pods? Now, obviously, because Caverno is no longer running, that errors and it blocks the creation of those two new pods. So we have no Caverno and we cannot recreate Caverno. What happens now is that no new pods can be created within this cluster at all. It means that if auto scaling kicks in and tries to scale up or scale down or, or whatever, we won't be able to have those new pods created. If a, a node is replaced, if, a, if a, a control plane node is replaced, for example, the API server pods won't be able to be created. Basically, we're in a very, very fragile state until we've got this fixed. So in this scenario, manual intervention was needed to temporarily disable that webhook, allow those pods to be created and have it, have it reapplied. Um, now, the, the long-term solution to this is to make sure that uh, the anti-affinity on those pods is set to spread them across the failure domains to kind of lessen this, this potential impact. But let's move on to incident two. So this was a cluster upgrade. So in this scenario, we've got a cluster that's got several mutating and validating web pods in place. Uh, many of them are against pods, um, create, delete, upgrade, whatever. Um, some of the services behind the webhooks uh, includes, but it's not limited to applications such as Cert Manager, Instana, Kiverno, and LinkedIn. Uh, sorry, LinkedIn. Um, all of these are off-the-shelf third-party Helm charts, um, pretty much deployed with their default values. And, and by default, they come with their own webhooks that do various things. So we've got a bunch of webhooks in play that none of the teams in the company uh, built themselves. So what happened here? Um, an upgrade of the cluster was, was triggered to, to upgrade the Kubernetes version. Um, the cluster itself had a lot of spare capacity within its nodes, so they weren't, they weren't full. Um, so the strategy was to remove 25% of the nodes at once, um, remove those, replace, remove, replace, et cetera, et cetera. Um, the upgrade itself was performed by making a change to the AWS launch template. Um, used by the nodes and then uh, the instance refresh functionality on ASG with, within a AWS. This is where we were able to set the 25% the and all this kind of thing. The initial 25% of the nodes that it was replacing included one control plane node and two worker nodes. When the three new nodes are launched, they are unable to schedule any pods. This includes the control plane nodes. So for example, um, if you looked at the controller manager logs, you would just see this internal error occurred, failed calling webhook, blah, 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 whatever the webhook happened to be. But this meant that any pods that are system critical API server, for example, couldn't be created. 
Now, the instances in AWS were reporting as running. So the instances themselves, the, the, the EC2 instances, were running and effectively healthy. But because the pods weren't coming up, they weren't healthy within our cluster. But this wasn't reflected in the health checks in EC2. So the instance refresh continued to cycle the rest of the cluster, thinking that those new nodes were, were good to go and moved on to the next. What happened here is the entire cluster was taken down if it wasn't caught early enough. Um, and in this scenario, we did catch it quite quickly. Um, but if, for example, this was triggered and then we left for lunch and we came back and our cluster was gone, um, wouldn't it be great. So the kind of learnings from this is we need to make sure that those health checks uh, on, our, on our instances match the health of the node itself, including the Kubernetes components and things like that. So that when we are leveraging these cloud specific tooling such as instance refresh they have some more information about the node itself rather than just the, the ec2 instance uh, so this one is, is one that i got uh, online from from jetstack so they had a very similar um issue with with webhooks and this was, this was with gke so google cloud um i'm going to just kind of read this verbatim because this is this isn't uh, my scenario. So um, they were in the process of upgrading the control plane for a development cluster used by many teams to test their apps during the working day. Uh, they began to upgrade uh, via a GKE Terraform pipeline. When performing the control plane upgrade, the operation did not complete before the Terraform timeout, which was set to 20 minutes. Uh, this was the first sign that something went wrong through the cluster. Uh, the cluster was still not it was still showing as upgrading in the GKE cluster, uh, console. So what went wrong here? Um, GKE completed the upgrade of one of the control plane instances and started, and that new instance started to receive all API server traffic uh, as the following control planes were being upgraded. Um, during the upgrade of the second control plane instance, the API was unable to run a post start hook, uh, which is a, a GKE uh, Terraform action, um, for the CA registration. The specifics aren't, aren't needed for, the, for this scenario. Uh, for the, for, for this purpose. Um, while running this hook, the API server attempted to update a config map in the Kube's in Kube system, but this operation timed out as the back end for the validating webhook, which was an uh, OPA open policy agent, it was not responding. So it was, it was included in that first set of, of replacements or, or whatever, for whatever reason it wasn't responding. Um, that, this operation must complete for the control plane to pass its health checks. So in this scenario, they did have health checks, um, that matched the, the node health. Um, but because it was continually uh, failed on the second control plane node, it entered effectively a, a crash loop and halted the upgrade. Um, Kubelet was then unable to report the node health. And GKE's uh, auto repair functionality that they've got um, basically continually recreated the nodes. Um, so what happened here is it had intermittent API downtime. So every time that the GKE was re uh, replacing that node, the API server would be you know, unavailable temporarily. And it meant that the actual upgrade itself was was blocked, was stalled. Um, so not ideal. Um, this is this is misnumbered. This is meant to say instant number four. Um, this is uh, a scenario that we did encounter ourselves. So this is um, when scaling to zero. So in a lot of enterprise scenarios, uh, we see non-production clusters. Um, uh, sorry, we see scenarios where, where they want to scale down their non-production clusters to zero nodes outside of working hours to save on cost, right? They have a lot of these clusters lying about. They don't want them uh, eating up resources when they're not needed. Um, so what happens is the, the control plane remains because you kind of need that to, to be able to run. Uh, it doesn't matter whether it's a single node or a HA cluster of three or whatever, but the control plane nodes remain regardless. Um, and it was set up the cluster auto scaler uh, to evict daemon sets um, and ignore uh, volumes on, on, the, on the, the node. And it, this was performed using a daily cron job that uh, run to scale down, the dip, scale down all deployments to zero replicas. And then again in the morning, scale them back up. This, this cron job uh, ran on the control plane, so it was always able to run. Um, but what it meant is because all of those deployments and stuff were scaled down to zero, cluster order scaler kicked in and realized that it could scale the work nodes all the way down to zero outside of working hours. All going well. For weeks, this was working as expected. Scaled down to zero, fine outside of working hours, scaled back up in the morning before people got into the office. Fantastic. At some point, um, 
a team that was using the cluster deployed a new application that included a, a validating webhook configuration with a failure policy set to fail. Now, it doesn't matter what this is uh, exactly. It could have been anything. It could have been a third party application. It could have been something they built themselves. It makes no difference. All that matters is that the failure policy was set to fail. So what happened was the cron job scaled the cluster down in the evening to zero. It, it, it set all the deployments to zero. Everything went down, the nodes went down. In the morning they came in, there was no worker nodes available. The, 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 um, uh, the autoscaler hadn't scaled the worker nodes back up. Now what happened here is that validating webhook configuration was blocking those new node creations. So when it tried, when the cron job set all the deployments back to one, two replicas, whatever it was, this webhook was meant to run against them, but because the application wasn't there because it had been scaled down, it failed. It then blocked the creation and it meant that cluster auto scaler thought, oh, I don't need any resources because there's no pods that I need to ship that need ships. Now, this, luckily this was a non-production environment, so it was easy enough to, to kind of solve uh, and, and didn't affect things too much other than, you know, worker productivity and things like that. So it's not a huge uh, scenario, but there are scenarios where this kind of happens in production where you may want to scale down a particular node pool um, uh, to zero or, or whatever. So we've looked at ways that things can go wrong. So let's see how we can potentially solve these issues and what we can do about these in the future. So some of the lessons learned from these scenarios, all webhook services, so that's all applications that are behind a webhook, that a webhook calls, um, ideally has to have at least two replicas, a pod disruption budget, anti-affinity, to ensure it's across different failure domains and health probes in place. And this is regardless of the, the seen importance of the functionality of the webhook itself. Because of the impact it can have on the entire cluster, it is then a cr of critical importance, regardless of what it is doing. Where possible, uh, a namespace selector should be used to ignore the kube system namespace so that we can at least ensure that critical cluster resources like the API server are able to be scheduled. This isn't possible for security related webhooks. Um, so you have to be extra careful with those sort of things. Similarly, if we can go a step further and use object selector so we can target just the specific resources we care about. Uh, and be just general advice, be careful when cycling nodes and relying on the, the cloud providers uh, health checks alone. Um, we've seen that cause issues in other scenarios as well. Um, and make sure you're you're aware of the impact of, of scale to zero um, and where pops are play. Um, and if possible, set the failure policy to ignore. So you may now be asking, what can we cluster operators do to avoid this, to kind of prevent application developers from making these, these admittedly quite simple mistakes to make? I mean, I've definitely be, been the cause of a few of these scenarios. So what can we do? Unfortunately, not a whole lot. Um, so the first kind of thought was, why don't we just create a webhook that enforces the creation of resilient webhooks? Because we can have this, these webhooks run against every resource and every API call, we can make sure that any webhooks are created meet this, these minimum standards of ours. Nope. Uh, unfortunately, as I said earlier, the webhooks can be applied to almost all resources and almost all API calls. There is this specific little line of code that prevents them from being run against themselves. So you can't have webhooks that target webhooks. Now, there's there's obviously reasons for this. You, you don't want to have a webhook that's able to then kind of take your cluster hostage by be able to prevent you from deleting itself. Um, but it's a little frustrating to find this out because we then had to move on to other ideas. So really, what you want to do is enforce best practices as much as you can. Um, now, this could be through either the training, making sure the teams are, are following these sort of best practices. But um, what we realize is while we can't have a webhook that watches other webhooks, we could have a webhook that, that watched services and deployments and then check if they had an associated webhook pointing to them so that we can then enforce the uh, best practices on those dependencies of the webhook. The only problem with this is those services and deployments are actually created in the API before the webhook is created otherwise they have always a webhook has nothing to point to so by the time you see the see the these resources the webhook hasn't been created yet so you don't know that they're a webhook dependency 
So instead, we, we kind of have to enforce best practices on all of our deployments and all of our services um, to ensure that any that are potentially a dependency of a webhook is there and available. Um, now, we all will follow best practices at all points, right? I hope we at least try to. So maybe we just need to take a little bit further. Uh, the final thing that we looked at is rather than preventing the issue, is to actually just get more visibility on the issue and so we can uh, see what risks a cluster has so that we can be more mindful of these uh, in the future. For example, we have a, a watchdog that uh, uses metrics, uh, created a dashboard in Grafana that shows the, for example, the amount of webhooks that don't have a, ne a namespace selector associated with them or, or that has less than two replicas backing it. Um, as you can see here, this particular test cluster is in a very, very risky state, and there's a lot that could go wrong. Now, thankfully, this is a test cluster that was kind of for this purpose, but uh, this allows us to at least have some uh, insight as to where things may go wrong and where we may need to focus our attention. Uh, one thing I want to very briefly talk about is uh, the use of uh, out of cluster services. So the webhooks can actually point to a external endpoint, so a URL rather than uh, a service reference within the cluster. So this allows you to kind of point to another uh, application hosted elsewhere. So you're then not able to block the creation of itself, like we saw in the Caverno issue. Um, the problem with this is then you need a whole nother lifecycle management system to make sure that that application stays up and, and running and available, et cetera, and that you've then got network to deal with and other potential problems that could make this an issue. Um, I haven't actually, I haven't seen scenarios of this in the wild. Um, if anybody does have any examples of this, I'd be very interested to see. So the possible future, there are some in progress um, proposals um, around this sort of thing. Um, so one of them that has actually since been dropped was around manifest, manifest based registration of webhooks. Um, so while this wouldn't necessarily solve the issues that we've been seeing, this was um, to allow you to create webhooks upon cluster creation, similarly to static pods. Um, so this was focused on security in mind, where there's a very brief window between cluster creation and deploying of your applications where the cluster basically is, is without security restrictions. So while this wouldn't necessarily solve the issue, it's in a similar vein, but it's been dropped. So we'll ignore that. Next one I want to mention, but it's not related to what we've been talking about specifically, is around CRD validation expression language. So this is actually related to the third type of webhook that I talked about, so the CRD webhooks that handle the conversion. Um, they now have the ability to use CEL, uh, common expression language. Uh, to add a bit of validation to the, the payload that, that performs the, um, the the conversion. It may be that in the future, this uh, or this or similar uh, is also extended to be able to be used with the other webhooks that we take the validating, which would then mean that that logic will be done by the API server rather than a, a, an external service and deployment. We will see. The one that I think does hold potential to be the way to go in the future. Um, this was proposed uh, in 2022 uh, at KubeCon. Uh, well, I think it was proposed a bit more than that, but a bit, bit before that, but the uh, the demo was given at, at KubeCon 22. And this is to use WebAssembly for your uh, webhook logic rather than relying on a pod. What this meant is there was less uncertainty from whether the pod is running, whether networking is available to actually connect to the pod and all this kind of thing. And instead, that web assembly would be run by the API server itself. So as long as the API server was able to receive the API call, it would be able to, to run the webhook logic. Now, I think there's a lot of potential in this idea, but as of right now, there's not been a huge amount of traction on this to get it included into Kubernetes. So. Watch this space, hopefully we'll see something. So to wrap up, the wonders. Um, webhooks could be fantastic for using for doing defaulting, policy enforcement, best practices, and issue mitigation. But at the same time, there's a lot of woes. So webhooks, uh, the services need to be resilient. The cluster can be taken down if not careful. And I said, I've seen this multiple times. Uh, and there's very little that can be done at a cluster level to ensure foolproof webhooks are used. 
in the future, hopefully, we will see less reliance on webhooks um, and, and things like schema validation and other um, admission, uh, admission plugins may become available that uh, solve some of the, these weaknesses that we see in webhooks today. That is all I have. Thank you very much. If you want to uh, see the slides, there's a link up at the top there where you can access them. Um, if you have any questions that you think about after the after this webinar or want to talk to me about anything else, feel free to either email me or get me on Mastodon.